Today we're talking about the future of work, where we're all going to be working, and as leaders, what we ought to be thinking about. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. My guest today is Aaron Dignan, and I'm going to tell you all about Aaron, and then we're going to dive in. So let me tell you about Aaron. He is the founder of The Ready, a global organizational transformation and coaching practice, and Aaron has helped companies large and small adopt new forms of self-organization and dynamic teaming. Clients include organizations you've heard of like General Electric and Kaplan and Lloyd's Banking Group and Microsoft and Citibank and Hyatt and Airbnb and Charles Schwab and PG&E, like in pretty much name the type of company. And Aaron's organization had the chance to work with them. Uh, he is an active angel investor and helps build partnerships between startups and end-ups. And the end-ups he advises. He also is a co-founder of Responsive.org. He is set on advisory boards at GE and American Express and PepsiCo, and uh, as well as the board of directors for Smashburger. If you've ever had a Smashburger, we can now thank Aaron. Um, he is the author of Game Frame and his brand new book. It's called Brave New Work. I have my copy. He has his there. Uh, he won't have to look at it because he wrote it. Um, Aaron, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Glad to be here. Uh, so uh, that's a that's an impressive bio for a, and so if, if you all are watching you know that Aaron is not he's not as old as I am so uh so tell us a little bit about your journey how did you sort of get to this place Aaron I mean for me I, I've been you know kind of coaching and and working with organizations literally since I came out of school but it's always been this through line of you know human potential and what can we unlock and what does it mean to be able to do more and achieve more and kind of uh, fulfill our our uh, professional destiny. And so, um, you know, in the early days, that was really about chasing trends and, and spending time in the digital, you know, transformation space and thinking about how all these amazing technologies, exponential and disruptive technologies would would shape our uh, our lives. And then somewhere along the way, I started to notice that it really, it wasn't the technology that was so disruptive. It was really more the mindset and, and the nature of change that was kind of going on around it. So it was, you know, can we, can we adapt? Can we, can we adjust course? Can we learn from what's happening out in the market? And each, you know, each technology kind of presented that, that change challenge to, uh, to the organizations that affected it. And I started to realize that while most of our clients were very excited about the you know latest thing, uh, very few large organizations that I worked with had that ability, that ability to learn, that ability to adapt, that ability to yeah. kind of shape shift, and and you know fewer still had the ability to do that while also holding um, a kind of a value of social benefit and social good and impact at the same time, and so that became uh, a curiosity of mine. And uh, at the same time, I was sort of frustrated with my own management style. So I had, you know, I'd grown a firm uh, up to, to a significant size and, and was having a lot of fun, but was feeling like I was too critical to the success of the company. I was too detail oriented. I was micromanaging. I was kind of burning myself out. No um, one, by the way, on listening to us, Aaron, has ever felt has that. Has never done that. Yeah, no, exactly. No, right. no micromanagers here. We don't allow them to listen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, I mean, I was guilty as charged on that front. I just felt like there's got to be a better way to do this. And I don't see, I don't see us kind of doing it as well as I think is possible. And I also don't see um, some of our clients really leading the way. So I went on a bit of a walkabout and went and looked at, you know, what's going on in non-human systems, biological systems, uh, you know, for everything ranging from ants to neurons, to the immune system, to cities, to you name it. Um, and then also looking at, uh, 
at organizations that were kind of unrecognized at the fringe or that get, you know, significantly less coverage than they deserve all around the world, literally in almost every, you know, in almost every continent, I found examples of organizations that had really flipped bureaucracy over and said, we're going to do this in a more human way. We're going to do this in a more agile way. Um, and had found remarkable ways to do that at scale. And so I kind of came back from that, uh, from that exploration and a lot of my fellow colleagues were sort of on the same on the same ride and we looked at each other and sort of decided that we wanted to we wanted to share that and so um, you know the company the ready now is actually uh, really focused on changing how the world works um, taking the factory floor model from a hundred years ago that really defines the way most people work today still uh, and turning on its head and say let's let's do away with the needless bureaucracy Let's focus in on how to build firms that learn and firms that make us feel meaning and make us feel human. Um, and we can, you know, we can have all those things. We can, we can have our cake and eat it too, as long as we're willing to um, engage in the work that it takes to do that. And, and thus the title of the book, uh, it's not, it's not easy new work It's brave new work. Um, and so that, that's kind of how I got here. All right, so any of you who have been watching slash listening to me for any length of time on this podcast or anywhere else, you now know why uh, I resonated with this book. And before I ever met Aaron, we haven't met, before we even met here five <laughs> minutes ago, eight minutes ago. So um, I I'm excited to have you here. And so your book, the title, you talked about the title, Brave New Work, which is really excellent. The first big section of the book is called The Future of Work. So you've sort of hinted at that, but what else would you say, uh, Aaron, about what is the future of work from your perspective? Yeah, well, I think in many ways I titled it that because there's a tension for what it's going to be. And, and that section of the book explores the history of how we got to the, the operating system that we use now, um, the kind of Tayloristic scientific management, thinkers and doers, boxes and lines way of working. Um, and, and, and sort of where we're headed. And I think we have a choice. We're based with a choice right now as a culture. We have a lot of intractable problems. We have a lot of complex systems around us in the economy and business and the environment and politics, obviously. Um, and we can choose. Are we going to kind of double down on that model, that command and control model, and try to put it back together through force, which you see certain actors in, in the world stage trying that approach? Um, or are we going to accept that complexity needs to be met with a different approach? And, and that unlocks a future of work that looks a lot different. It's more decentralized. It's, you know, it's more interconnected. It's more relational. It's, it, you know, it's more adaptive. It's more human. And it's probably made up of a, di you know, a different kind of a marketplace that's not quite so grow at all costs, kill everyone but yourself, um, you know, focused on the individual performance and the individual outcome, um, it'll be a little bit more communal, I think, and a little bit more socially positive. Um, so I think those are the those are the futures, right? We can have a future where there's a few Jeff Bezoses and uh, a lot of AI and a lot of robots and a lot of people out of work and, and uh, you know, the stock market is traded every 15 seconds and we're all still looking for the, the short-term win. Or we can have a future of work that is... Um, a return to some of our basic human values. And I think, yeah, as things start to break is the moment when you have to choose how you're going to show up to the challenge. And I think we all sense that there's some uh, instability in, in the way we do business and the way our economy works and the way our government works. And, and now we have to choose. And so the, the future of work is a question mark. And so everybody, there, you may be thinking, well, that was, that was sort of a very big picture answer. Well, I asked a big picture question, what I, <laughs> what I asked for, uh, but I really want to take the rest of our time because some of us are saying, well, listen, I'm not thinking about the government and I'm not thinking, you know, I'm not running for president or whatever, and I, <laughs> I'm not running the UN and, you know, whatever. Uh, but I, do, I think all those, I mean, I'm, I wanted you to sort of unpack some of that because it's, it's in the book, um, but the, the big chunk well, the, the other, there are two other big chunks of the book. We'll talk about them both. But uh, I think the, the, the super interesting part, the most interesting part of the book to me, was the second section when you use the phrase already, operating system. You write about something called the operating system. Um, and I'm, I, I'd like to start with why, why is that the metaphor that you selected? It's a tough one uh, because you try to figure out a way to make this idea accessible. And, uh, you know, the one thing that's nice about operating system is, people have a very basic sense that it means something foundational. 
something that's sort of underneath that's running all the time on which we have to build everything else. And so even though some people might misinterpret it as a very highly technical metaphor, I just mean literally what the words say, an operating system, a set of principles and practices that define how we get our work done. And if you look at any problem space, any challenge, any endeavor, there's always an underlying OS uh, in terms of the way it works, whether that's DNA in the human body or whether that's, I mean, one of the examples I love using that's in the book is comparing two kinds of, uh, of intersection. You got two roads crossing. How do you do it? Yes, this is a, um, this is a, listen, this is a uh, conversation my wife and had, wife and I had every time we go around one. And I actually <laughs> read her uh, the statistics that you talked about in the book yeah. um, for us. And we had this ongoing conversation about it. Oh, so funny. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for those that haven't uh, heard it or seen it, essentially the, you know, the problem space is two roads crossing and one OS, which is the signal controlled intersection believes and assumes that people are kind of generally untrustworthy and unfocused and need to be sort of told what to do. And so you I'm got sure red lights. The unfocused one is bad. I mean, is it bad? I'm not sure that's a bad assumption, but <laughs> <laughs> it might be true. Um, well, that's, I mean, I'm glad you bring that up because one of the things that's interesting about operating systems is, you know, is it the fish or the aquarium? When you look at behavior, is it the nature of the thing that we're unfocused or are we unfocused because our OS has made us unfocused? And so I think that uh, we often have big debates in, in my world about what is the nature of someone versus how are they expressing themselves in a, in a particular context. So anyway, you got, uh, you got the light at intersection. It sort of assumes that people need to be controlled and, and move through it you know, at the right way, uh, at the right time. And as, as a result, there's a huge apparatus behind the intersection. There's a control center and there's electrical grid and there's you know, a lot of time and investment that goes into building that uh, structure. And then there's another operating system, another point of view about the problem, which is the roundabout, which says, let's, not, let's actually trust people and just have a couple basic rules or guidelines that hold us in place. So go in the direction of traffic and give the right of way to the people in the circle. And we'll just let people use their judgment uh, to, to use the circle effectively. And what is remarkable about this metaphor is that, um, you know, there are a thousand times more signal controlled intersections in the United States than there are roundabouts. And yet, when you look at roundabout data from, you know, United States, from not from Europe or somewhere where people are more comfortable with it, but, you know, from our own states, uh, it's safer, it's much safer on fatality collisions, it's higher throughput, um, it's cheaper to build and maintain. And of course, uh, everyone knows that the roundabout works better when the power goes out. So it's more kind of resilient. And so, um, you know, so you look at the data and the data says, well, this is much better in terms of performance, but this is more popular. And even when you talk to people and say, well, what, what makes you feel safe? Oh, I never, I don't feel safe in a roundabout. It feels like chaos to me. People don't know what they're doing. Um, but in actuality, you are safer. And even when people don't know what they're doing, you're safer. And so um, I like that analogy because when we start to go then look at the world of work and we say, what OS are we using to approach our budgets or our plans or our compensation or our performance reviews or our structure? It's not uncommon that the same phenomenon is happening where we have a control oriented OS applying itself to one of those problem spaces when in fact, the better alternative is out there. It's just, it just doesn't feel comfortable. Um, and so that's, that's really what it's all about. And it might not feel more comfortable for a variety of reasons, including. Yeah, totally. Totally. It. I mean, like, like, like don't ask my mom about and... the roundabouts. She's got bad stories, right? Right, um, right. Because, uh, so yeah, there's all sorts of factors. And I love, I do love that analogy as well. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought it up. But you, you just started to give, rattle off some examples, which are some of, in the book you talk about, well, I'm going to call them pieces, um, examples of uh, the operating system right metaphor and you mentioned a couple but you mentioned other more specific things but um so i have some specific things uh within the operating system stuff that you talk about that i want to dive into in a minute but i'm just going right. to ask a more general question of so what are a couple you, again the 12 uh in the book what what are a couple of them that you think are maybe especially important or for whatever reason today you feel like you want to talk about yeah no for sure um like because i'm not controlling you here Aaron. i'm giving you full geez. decision on how a you nudge, a nudge is not control, right? I mean, it's okay to. Well, I did say encourage. one of the twelve. I guess I did control you in that regard. Right. I don't mind an enabling constraint. <laughs> I just don't want a governing constraint. Um, so yeah, I mean, what's interesting is the way we got to these twelve spaces. Just to preface it very briefly, is we asked all these organizations that are known for their way of working being particularly 
adaptive and human and non-bureaucratic, what's different about you? And they gave us answers in the form of, well, we do this and we do that. We just pinned them to the wall and eventually this pattern evolved. It was like, oh, well, there's these 12 spaces where again and again we're hearing, we do this differently, we do this differently, we do this differently. And so the spaces then became revealed and it's everything from you know purpose and authority and structure, which are very kind of big picture common, all the way down to things like mastery, how we kind of learn and grow and, and you know, develop our skills or meetings or um, workflow or innovation, right? So there, these 12 spaces were, are very generic uh, intentionally because they're sort of empty vessels for, you can do it the old way, you can do it a new way, you can do it an alternative way. It doesn't you know, really matter. What matters is, is it serving you? And, and do you understand it? Is it, is it intentional? Um, so the ones that I personally think are most interesting, I mean, I think structure and authority right off the bat are fundamental to kind of realizing what's next. Because when we live in the traditional model of you don't have any authority, you need to ask permission, and you're in a structure that's very siloed and very top down and, and many leveled, um, you limit options and you, you limit dynamism. And so those two to me are kind of fundamental. And then I'm also very, very interested in, you know, the meeting space and the workflow space and the information space, because to me, that's the day to day nitty gritty, right? It, in some ways, a meeting is a microcosm of the whole organization. No doubt. So, I learn a lot. As, a, as I'm sure as you do, you, as a consultant, you walk into an organization, you sit in a you meeting. You see a meeting, you've seen a you snapshot, a right? It's, you learn yeah. a lot real quick and no doubt. And, you know, we just had, a, well, you don't know, but just recently we had an episode uh, I had a conversation with Elise Keith, just episode 145, if you all want to go back, where we talked, you know, that's all thing we talked about was meetings, right? And how right. to make meetings better and make meetings matter. And we talked about some unique things that are different. Um, yeah. And there's some connections, I think, in what you talked about here. Um, totally. So, so you got some, I, some thoughts about some of the real big ones like structure uh, and then the more nitty gritty of, of meetings. Uh, another one maybe that you want to hit on real quick? I mean, gosh, they're all interesting. I'd be curious what you're drawn to. I obviously, I, I could have written an entire book about every single one of them. The biggest challenge of writing this book was how do you say what needs to be said about something like resource allocation in 3,000 words? Um, yeah, and in some cases less, right? I was struck by how much you were able, you know, now we'll go, we'll go inside baseball between two authors and you all have to listen. To that. But I was struck by how you were able to make some decisions there. And, and, I, and I thought, you know, I mean, obviously I wasn't in your head but I knew there was more you could have said, certainly. My gosh, yeah. But I think yeah. for uh, what I would say to those of you listening that need to go buy a copy of the book, The Brave New Work by Aaron Dignan, uh, is see, if you're watching, you can see it's not super thick. And, um, and so I think it's accessible. And, and, and you get to some ideas, I think, quickly. And so what I actually wanted to do, interestingly enough, the way this conversation is evolving, is I had three or four of the things that you talked about in maybe – 300 words, um, mm -hmm. you know, that I thought we'd talk about a little bit more. Oh, was, totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's right? fantastic. So one of the things that, that, um, that I had never said it this way, but I completely agreed with. And so of course I want to talk about things that I agreed with. Right. Um, but one of those we in, in the, in the section on purpose, um, you talk about this idea of purpose being fractal or needing mm. to be fractal. I'm yeah. a fan of the idea of something things being practical and and I love I love that idea so would you unpack that for us and we can let's just chat about that for a minute yeah totally I think what is has become more in vogue in of late but even wasn't really that popular before is to have an inspiring purpose at the corporate level at the organizational level whether you're a startup or an end up but to say like our, you know we exist in the world to put this dent in the universe and isn't that inspiring and motivating and that's great. I'm, and I'm glad to see more companies forced to figure that out because there's still a lot of companies out there that their purpose statement reads, you know, like an old Enron document or something like it's just not that, not that real. Um, however, there's a missing piece that exists for a lot of people in the organization, which is how that then connects to my work. And if I'm a cashier, if I'm someone working on the line, if I'm someone that's engaging with customers, if I work in the HR department, um, I don't often know how to connect my work with that reality and, and, and how to sort of make my dent in that, in that bigger dent. And so the idea of fractal purpose is just to say that um, it's important to have the conversation going with everyone in the organization at a team level, at an individual level, at a team of teams level, and at an org level of what is our purpose and how does it fit or not fit in with everything else that's going on there's a difference to me between having the conversation and kind of a grassroots bottom up 
um, alignment there and the instinct to top down sort of unpack the purpose and mandate it so that it's self-similar at every level. I think that's a misreading of, of Fractal. What I'm saying is if people don't know how their personal purpose, their team purpose, their team of teams purpose fits in with the bigger picture, if they can't see how they're serving, um, then a lot of things go wrong. A, there's, it's hard to understand why your work is meaningful. And B, when you don't understand a, a local purpose in the context of a broader one, you can't use either one for steering. And I think one of the things that's so interesting about the world of more autonomous, more empowered work is we need people to make a lot more decisions and we need them to make decisions in service of something and in service of the purpose is a great foil for those decisions as opposed well, to in better service one of is there you could argue right yeah, exactly but, totally and so you know i go back to um a long time ago <laughs> 25 years ago um when when uh, i i knew some folks that were involved as auditors i think they called them of the uh, of people that had submitted Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award right. applications, right? So these were folks that were going, consultants who were going into the organizations looking to help assess whether, how good their application was, whether they would be a winner and all that sort of stuff. And one of the things that struck me about that was this thing that in, in companies that were deemed winners in that, you know, doing lots of things in a highly quality way, one of the cool things was basically this idea of fractal purpose that people anywhere in the organization that you went and they said what is it that we're about and and can you connect what you do to that and they could do it and yeah. it wasn't because it came top down it was about them the word i like is discovering the yeah. alignment and connecting me to that right and in my organization totally. with 15 of us even there we we need to we need to work at that collectively it's my Absolutely. job as a leader to help people figure that out not to tell them what it is Right, but just to make the space for it and, and to facilitate it and to be aware of the fact that, you know, everyone is a fully functioning, living, breathing human being who already has personal values and purpose baked in. And then they're showing up to a party that you're holding <laughs> and they're bringing that stuff with them. And now there's a, you know, a fit that has to occur. And, and like you've spent a bunch of time to hire them and then suddenly you don't want to trust them when they arrive. I've never right, quite right, right. that. Like yeah, yeah. all this time. I trust yeah, you just trust enough them. to show up. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so another one of the things that you talked about was, um, I believe that the acronym was SLAM. You called them SLAM teams. Can you unpack that one for us for a sec? Yeah. So um, what, one of the things we figured out really early in this work, even in my prior company, is that um, new teams working in new ways can really shake things up. Because when, when a team takes on a project, it is a kind of a microcosm of the organization and there's a way to work differently that that creates a completely different experience for team for mem members of a team than they usually have mostly when you're on a project in a big bureaucratic environment or even a small one for that matter you're feeling like you've been tasked to do something but you don't have the necessarily the decision rights to actually make the key decisions about it you are in constant reviews and check-ins you don't have the things that you need because you have to go talk to legal or IT or whoever. And so as a result, you're, you're quite kind of limited in your ability. The idea of the SLAM team was just to use a silly acronym as a way to kind of reinforce the key ingredients of what we thought might break that mode. And so um, the S stands for like self-organized or self-managed. Um, so the idea being that the team has the freedom to make the decisions it needs to make and produce the outcome it's going to produce. And they'll also deal with the consequences of their choices, but they, but they kind of need to be in the driver's seat. And then the L stands for lean, which is really just trying to fight that trend of let's get everybody on, you know, let's have a 40 person meeting and see how that goes. So lean means, you know, seven plus or minus two people on the team, like keep it, you know, just enough and no more. Um, the A is audacious. So one of the things that we've learned in observing and talking to a lot of companies in the book is, you know, when you have goals that are inspirational and when you try to do things that are, uh, you know, a step function in, in performance away from the norm, you un often unlock a lot of different kinds of thinking and innovation. So sometimes it's very helpful to have to have an audacious purpose or an audacious goal that can free the team's thinking from just that incremental thinking of, oh, let's do it, let's do it 5% better or 1% better. Um, and then the M stands for multidisciplinary, which is cross-functional. How do we make sure, if we, do we need a, a legal review? Let's have a lawyer on the team. Do we need a marketer? Let's have a marketer on the team. And let's blow up the functional silos that are you know, slowing everything down as it has to go across each bulkhead. 
and instead, um, you know, get everybody in the same room or at least ownership of it right from the start. Yeah, totally. totally. But the other thing that you're getting by doing that, and I'm not saying anything you don't know, or even anyone listening doesn't know, but to remind everybody is that when we do that, we not only break down the silos and all the other stuff that you described, but we get different, we get divergent uh, experiences. And so we get this holy grail that we're always looking for, which is diversity of right, thought right. and experience. And we get it automatically when we do yeah. that. Many yeah, you've increased, you increase the cognitive diversity of the team exponentially. And to your point, I think, you know, if you're a lawyer receiving the brief after nine weeks of work and you're identifying with yourself as part of a, a risk department, then you're thinking like, what's in it for me is to say no. Like that, I'm, my job essentially is to try to minimize risk and I'm sitting in that seat. If I'm on the team on the whole way, my job is to contribute and to shape and to you know help find a way Help forward. it work as opposed yeah. to, well, and even, and uh, even if, even if as the corporate attorney, your focus is, you know, trying to be as open to it at all as, as anything, as a human, you want to sort of be known that you did something. And if you don't totally. send back any feedback, oh, yeah, he must not even read the darn thing. Right. So yeah. he or she, uh, and so, yeah, I think that it, it sets us up. Yeah. People, they don't understand the intent, all they got the words, everything about it. It's just not great in that regard. Um, totally. So I could probably go with five more <laughs> But I, I, what I want to sort of give people that we need to pay off here. So you talk, yeah. you talk in the book, and we've talked so far about sort of the big reason why, perhaps. And you talked a little bit about what some of the pieces are. Uh, but people listening may be saying, okay, but how do I – I like that. I like what Aaron's telling me. But how do I get there? The third part of the book is called The Change. And, and obviously, what they need to do is buy a copy of the book, the brand, brand new work. But give us a couple of thoughts about, okay – if I'm a, a manager in the middle somewhere and I like some of what this is about, what, what can I, what can someone listening do with some of this right away? Uh, how can they take some action? Yeah, totally. I think, um, you know, it depends on, it depends on who you are, right? So if you have, if you hold a lot of power, then your ability to, you know, distribute that authority and take broader action is obviously greater. So I, I don't want to discount that. And a lot of our clients do, in fact, start with, you know, a CEO or a CHRO or a P&L leader or a functional head or what have you, or a founder, startup founder. Um, however, we, we have a lot more influence over the way we work than we think we do. And, and a team at any level. Okay, stop right there. <laughs> Everyone, if you say that again, Aaron, because that is so true. And so many people don't want to take that ownership would you just that's say right that yeah, yeah yeah no i think i think it's worth saying again we have a lot more ownership over the way we work than we think we do um and and the way to see that is just to go into almost any you know meeting of any team and just look at like how they're relating to each other how they're communicating how they're solving problems how they're planning you know the tools that they're using etc um it's true that eventually you hit you know you do hit a wall where you have to kind of either um seek permission or forgiveness but um but there's so much in the OS that, that we do control and that we can shape and, and reshape. So what I often invite um, teams to do is just start with that. Start with what you can control. And we ask teams a very simple question. You know, what's stopping you from doing the best work of your life? Um, and the answer to that question will reveal to you the, the spaces where you need to play. And we have this very simple process that we call looping in the book, which basically just goes from I have attention. I have something that's holding me back or that I feel like we should be doing that we're not doing or that we are doing. I think we should stop or fill in the blank. And now what are the possibilities? What are the practices? What are the things we could try instead? So we're having, you know, we're a meeting I don't like. Well, what if we canceled the meeting for two weeks? What would happen? Or what if we changed the structure of the meeting? Or what if we changed who shows up? And then once you've identified the practices that you think are worth trying, then designing a small, controlled, safe to try experiment. And just saying, all right, let's 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 try it. So like one of the very simple things that we teach teams early on is just to check in and out of meetings. And a check-in is just a chance to hear everyone's voice. Literally, it's just that. Of course, it's fun if the question's interesting. Of course, it's great if you get some insight out of it. But at the end of the day, it's really just about conversational turn-taking and getting present in the room. And so we'll say, you know, hey, there's a little bit of a trust problem on this team or we don't feel connected or there's a sense of, you know, um, people aren't present in, in engagement. Great. Let's just, could we try a check-in for, you know, at the beginning of every meeting for the next four weeks, would that be safe to try? Well, that's not going to do anything. 
but could we try it? Is it safe to try? Yeah, it's, yeah, is we can try gonna, it. Yeah, are we going to get in trouble? Is there going right. to be an issue? Well, no, yeah. let's just try it. How do we know until we try it? Right, exactly. And all it takes is one person on the team seeing a possible future and saying, I think I have an idea of something we could try to unlock that future. That's enough to get the ball rolling and everyone else can decide, all right, well, if this isn't going to cause an irreversible change, then let's jump in and see what happens. And through doing that looping process over and over again, the team slowly starts to take ownership over its own OS, its own way of working. And you see these incredible gains that occur because people start to ask bigger and bigger questions. So when I start with a project team, I, you know, I start with a CEO for that matter. No one on the team is going to say, the thing that's holding me back from doing the best work of my life is the budgeting process and we need to blow it up. But that might be the 12th question. Right. You know, it might be the 12th idea that occurs is, wait a second, why do we do budgeting annually? It doesn't make a ton of sense in a world that changes this fast. Why do we do budgeting annually and make commitments that we don't know we're going to want to follow through? Anything with? about. Yeah. And so, you know, but when you're ready to ask that question, you're then ready to design the experiment. Right. That will help you unpack what's possible. And I know some people, uh, you know, interpret the word experiment differently. Some people think it means that we, you know, don't have a good idea of what will work. And that's not what I mean. What I mean is things that have worked for so many of these other organizations that I feature in the book and for organizations that we all respect. Um, the experiment is, can it work here? And, and what, what adjustments and customizations and modulations need to happen for us all to show up to that better way of doing, you know, whatever it might be, meeting, allocating resources, you know, developing people, building a team, you name it. Absolutely. So I just got a couple more questions as we start to wrap up and I'm going to really pretty much shift gears on you here. Uh, <laughs> but one is, so you're a busy guy. You've got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, you've just finished another book. Congratulations. And so what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Uh, I have recently gotten very, very interested in, uh, in climbing. So I've been uh, been bouldering and uh, and climbing top rope um, at a variety of different places here in Colorado, and it's it's an me, easier place to climb there than say in Central Indiana. Just correct, so. correct, much easier. Um, but what it's what it's been uh, what's been exciting about it for me is, you know, given what I do and and how I think, I'm kind of an always on kind of kind of thinker. I'm always either taking in input or or regurgitating it back out again. And climbing, there's no room for that. You, like you're, you're in it, it's a Zen state, it's a flow state. You're, you know, your mouth is shut, your ears are shut, you're just present in your own body. Um, that seems to be really good for me. There you go. And so the only question I told you about ahead of time, what are you, uh, what are you reading now or what have you read recently? Let me show you actually, I will, uh, I'm gonna do a visual aid as well. And so, while he's getting that, for those of you that only listen, you can, you can watch. Well, yeah. So go ahead. You could watch, yeah. uh, but I'll also obviously say the name of it. This is uh, my buddy Douglas Rushkoff's new book, Team Human, um, and it is a whopper. Uh, he's always been a futurist and always kind of ahead of uh, ahead of the curve, but this one is kind of the sum of of really all of his ideas. Um, and it, you know, you think some of the stuff I was referencing in the beginning was big picture. Uh, pick this thing up. It is. Uh, it's a hoot and a holler about remaking society. So um, yeah, that one's been inspiring me a little bit. And uh, beyond that, I have been um, catching up on all the amazing newsletters and blogs that I read as well. There you go. All right. So, and probably the question you've most wanted me to ask you, which is how can I learn, how can everybody learn more about you, get the book, last chance to say anything about any that you want to say? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, uh, there's two places to go online. So you can go to bravenewwork.com and find out more about the book and, um, order and order it and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, the ready also has a website at theready.com, which is helpful. And then if you want to talk to me, I'm at Aaron Dignan on Twitter. Yes, he is. And so everybody, now that you've been listening to us, now I have a question for you before we go. And what I always ask is now what? So what are you going to do with all of this? It was interesting for sure. It's entertaining, I hope. But what we really want you to do is not just be intellectually interested but to take some action and so what ideas did you get that you might want to go try maybe it's asking that question of yourself what's stopping me from doing the best work of my life maybe that's asking your team maybe it's challenging an assumption maybe it's trying something new uh, with your team what are you going to do now as a result of us spending a little bit of time together
Well, I want to thank you all for being here. And Aaron, I want to thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, likewise. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And for all of you who are listening, if this is whether this is your first or your 148th time that you've joined us, uh, I'm so glad that you did. And I just want you to know that if you resonate with the kind of things we talk about here, you might want to take a look at one little site. It's remarkablepodcast.com forward slash way, W-A-Y. And you can learn about a new thing that we're up to and join the list to learn more about that at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash way. And with that, everybody, again, I'll thank you, Aaron, and I'll thank all of you for joining us. And thanks for joining us on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.